So this is chapter 31? Yeah. It's what, just uh, January 23rd, 2020. Mm -hmm. We didn't finish last <laughs> year. So we're finishing human action. We're going to do it. This year. Yeah, we'll just keep going. So chapter 31, currency and credit manipulation. Yeah. Number one, the government and the currency. And here's a comment. A thing becomes money only by virtue of the fact that those exchanging commodities and services commonly use it as a medium of exchange. Correct. What, that's a comment? That's, that's not a, a question. Okay, yeah. great. That's true. <laughs> what were some typical government interventions with regard to currency? Um, the government intervention, like setting the price of uh, gold, having a bimetallic system. Yeah. Um, adjusting the price of that they will buy gold back for. Um, sometimes clipping the coins. That's right. a policy. That's funny. And uh, what else? The 1933 forced redemption of gold. Right. Um, or whatever. that, and just the, like uh, increasing the money supply. I think is another big one. Right. So there's a ton. Mm -hmm. Two, the interventionist aspect of legal tender legislation. What, what is the simplest and oldest variety of monetary interventionism? I'd say it's debasement. Yeah. When you talked about clippings, it's like what the ancient Romans did. Right. Yeah. yeah. What if I just took this here and uh, just maybe took a little bit off of that? <laughs> yeah. It's funny because it's like we do the same thing, or I guess the government does the same thing now, but it's a little more sneaky. Yeah. But it's the it's same harder. concept. It's harder to catch. It's a little less obvious to the layman. Right. If you were able to just, like, cut little pieces of the dollar up and, like, melt them and make new ones and, like... Yeah, people would be like, this dollar's smaller than all <laughs> the others. What the hell? What's going on? What are the consequences of debt abatement? Debt abatement uh, that creditors don't want to lend. What is abatement? The Stopping. Oh, okay. Okay, the cancellation of debt? Yeah. Right. Do governments ever engage in debt aggravation? Do they aim to do so? No. I mean, yes, they do do it, but no, they don't aim to do it. Because they always want to relieve debt at the expense of the creditors. But on occasion, they can aggravate debt by making the, um, the monetary policy to the favor of the creditors. Yeah, I, I would say that they are aiming... Like, if you, you listen to Trump in Davos, he wants... He wants the interest rate to be negative. And so he, he just wants to crank everything up into debt. So what it, I guess what is debt aggravation? Uh, from my understanding in the book, the term like debt abatement and debt aggravation are yeah. opposites. Mm -hmm. So when a central bank or government employs a monetary policy which makes your debt relieved mm -hmm. through inflation for example then that is debt abatement yeah. but when they make your debt worse okay so when they raise interest rates debt aggravation yeah i would think so okay like right then i'll agree with your previous statement yeah that they don't try to do debt aggravation because mm -hmm. there's more people who are in debt i would think yeah and they want the votes mm -hmm. uh section three the evolution of modern methods of currency manipulation why did the classical gold standard act as a rest restraint on monetary sorry let me why did the Classical Gold Standard act as a restraint on monetary interventionism? Uh, 
gold, it, it's a physical thing. So um, there's always that risk of like a bank run per se. And so having the ability to have a run on the bank um, restricts the government's ability to issue more currency. Yeah, it's it's honest because there's a limited supply. Mm-hmm. Why were economists, including Mises himself, naive concerning the gold exchange standard? Mm. I'll, I'll read what it says. Under the gold exchange standard, governments still pledge to redeem currency with specific quantities of gold. However, the public no longer carries gold in its cash holdings. It only holds money substitutes. Furthermore, the governments take steps to dissuade the public from, for, uh, from redeeming these notes and thus draining the reserves. By weaning the public from its holding of actual gold in its cash balances, the gold exchange standard gives the government much more flexibility in inflating the money supply. In fact, the gold standard, as it as it developed between the world wars, was dubbed the flexible standard because the pledge redemption ratio between currencies and gold could be adjusted to achieve the government's aim. This does this doesn't really talk about what Mises thought. No, I think it, it's demanding some critical thinking on our part because Mises isn't going to explain why he was wrong mm. in the book. That so is we true. Have, <laughs> we have to uh, think about why he's wrong, according to Robert Murphy. So the question again was, why were economists, including Mises himself, naive concerning the gold exchange standard? So maybe Mises thought that this gold standard would hold governments accountable. They didn't account for Bretton Woods or going off the gold standard completely. Right. Or how about this? Um, it... It's a promise by government agents to redeem your money substitutes for the money itself, the gold, but it presupposes that they will have the gold. Mm -hmm. And as Germany recently found out, they don't. Germany recently found out from who? From Fort Knox or the... New York Fed. Oh, did they try to repatriate? Yeah, Germany was like, we want our gold back. And they were like, mm-mm. And they were like, uh, well, can we have some of it back? No. And they were, <laughs> I think they said, yeah, yeah. But they were like, can we look at it in the vaults? And they were like, no. Hmm. Interesting. So there might not be any gold there. What is the definition of devaluation? Devaluation. Uh, believe it's when, for example, with gold, it was $20 mm -hmm. an ounce, fixed price set by the government. And then they, in 1933, were like, now the price of gold is $35 an ounce overnight. And I believe that's devaluation because yeah, your gold is now worth not as much. Well, wait a minute. Technically, it's worth the same. more. Your, it, the gold is worth the same. The dollars are worth less. The dollars are being devalued. Right. Okay. There you go. Thanks. An ounce of gold doesn't change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is meant by the flexible standard? I just... Well, sorry. I'm hung up on this concept having said it out loud now so gold from like 1780 something to 1933 was 20 dollars an ounce consistently 1780 when the constitution was written money was determined to be gold and yeah it was priced at 20 dollars an ounce so 
it stayed twenty dollars an ounce for like a hundred some years, and then the Fed was created in nineteen thirteen. Yeah, but the the devaluation I believe happened in nineteen thirty three. So that that was yeah. the first time. I mean, n- none of these were market prices. I, yeah, in nineteen hundred, there is the Gold Standard Act. I, I, in 1900 yeah i forget exactly i think that's when it instituted the 20 dollars. okay I, well, could, I could be mistaken but i do know there was a gold standard act in 1900 okay well the thing that I, i'm finding interesting is the speed at which devaluation is happening is much faster now it's rapidly accelerating because I've seen like about a doubling of prices in my lifetime. Right. And it's crazy seeing like, I think I just saw like an old order menu from like McDonald's or something. And five cents. Yeah. It's for, crazy. I don't know what, a burger or something. Yeah. And that was in like the seventies. What? Yeah. Wow. That's nuts. It is. And it's really nuts when you look at the Fed's balance sheet, like from a historical perspective, like in two thousand eight, and just ballooned, like quadrupled, like overnight. Huh. So I guess we can expect this to continue, this trend. Yeah, is... you can't, you can't like taper a Ponzi scheme. Like you gotta keep feeding it. Oh yeah, right, right. There's no chance of it trailing off. Yeah, you gotta just pump it more up. Hmm. Okay. Boy, that's interesting. It seems like the. I think hyperinflation is the only end result. Anything to. Like it's too. It would be too politically unpopular to not keep inflating the money supply. Hmm. So it seems like that's. Like, I, I don't think there's a politician. That could stop it. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for helping me think through that. Um, section four. The objectives of currency devaluation. What are the five object- objections? Uh, what are the five objectives of devaluation? I'm sure I can find them. Yeah. What are the five objectives? Um, well, I would think one is like debt relief for debtors. I'll just read it. Okay. Besides reducing real wage rates, governments Re- also hoped that currency devaluation, devaluation would achieve the following objectives. Reducing real wage rates. Reducing real wage rates. Why would governments want to do that? cheaper labor don't they want the people who vote for them to have increased real wage rates right but oh, real, we're, yeah we're talking about real wage weight mm. so it's perceived oh that's great it's wow like the perception is different right right okay yeah you could be getting a two percent raise but if inflation is five percent like technically you're getting more dollars right right okay Uh, so one, raise commodity prices, which would benefit farmers. Right, they love that. Favor debtors at the expense of creditors. Yeah, okay, got that one. Encourage exports and reduce imports. Oh yeah, this one's tricky for me. Encourage exports and reduce imports. Because now things cost a lot more to the outsider, but they're not benefiting from this like inflation themselves. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Attract more foreign tourists while discouraging citizens from visiting other countries. More foreign tourists. Why would that be? Oh, because their money is good, and yeah, when they convert they come it, come here with someone comes here with using gold as their money. They mm-hmm. can live as kings. All right. Okay, that's great. Okay, makes sense. Currency devaluation was a poor tool to achieve these ends. Unions learned soon enough to couch their demands in terms of real wages. Ah. Uh. 
aiding farmers with rising prices only punished consumers. Nominal interest rates incorporated a price premium in light of inflation. Finally, the alleged benefits on the balance of trade could only work even in the short run. One country devalued its currency more than its trading partner did. Yes. What are the negative consequences of devaluation? Are there positive ones too? The negative consequence. Didn't we just go through yeah, these? Come yeah, on. I kind of just read the whole section. The negative consequences, let me see if my memory is good enough. It reduces debt at the expense of the creditors. Mm -hmm. It increases production, or it increases um, prices of consumer goods, which benefits people like farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, but it hurts the consumer. It um, encourages more tourists to come and spend money in the country while discouraging people from leaving. It um, decreases real wage rates, which is a negative to the people, and they figure that out pretty quick. And five, it increases exports and decreases imports. Right. It's funny that those were the negative consequences, but you just, um, those were also the objectives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can devaluation provide a long run solution to institutional unemployment? Can devaluation provide a long term solution to, sorry, did I read it? Here? Yeah, to institutional unemployment. And no, it's causing, it's causing misallocation of resources. So in the end, it's going to lead to more, less jobs. <laughs> it's going to lead to less jobs. Uh, okay. Because why? Because it's, it's removing um, economic calculation. It's making it harder when you devalue the currency that you're investing with. It's going to be harder to make these economic choices because... Oh, employers won't be able to hire as many people. Yeah. They're like, I don't have the money for that. Right. Or they're, it's just going to lead entrepreneurs to be making wrong decisions because, um, you know, they're, they're investing in this constantly changing system that is unpredictable. But if it reduces real wage rates, wouldn't that be good for the entrepreneur? Maybe their labor costs go down. Ah, uh, yeah. But then they have other costs. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's a good point. I think that's it. Because it's talking about institutional unemployment. Which is, I think, that part of unemployment that basically stays the same. Or is, is caused by bad yeah. policy. Yeah. Institutional. It, se it suggests to me that it's like because of government action. Mm -hmm. I would say that. I, I don't really know what the word means in this context. Well, I would think that there'd be like natural unemployment or some other term for people who are just not looking for work because they don't need to and mm -hmm. they're not interested. But this is people who are like looking for work, but because of the factors involved, they can't find it. Hmm. Uh, section 5, credit expansion. To what does Mises refer when he says, the begetter of credit expansion was the banker, not the authority? What is the situation currently? Mm. Yeah. The begetter of credit expansion in the, in the free market, he says? It doesn't say anything about the free market. What does it say in the beginning? The begetter of credit... Ex oh, to what does Mises refer when he says, the begetter of credit expansion was the banker, not the authority? Yeah. 
it was before, I think, under a gold standard or under a situation of more, relatively more freedom, credit expansion came from the banks because they would be like, I'll loan you this. Mm -hmm. They just invented money out of nowhere. But now the quantitative easing of a central bank is the thing that creates money out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. I suppose banks still are begetters. Of, they, they still yeah. do create money. Fractional reserve lending. Yeah. Hmm. But that's that's a mandate. Well, it's it's a man like I, if I had the choice, I wouldn't want to deposit to a bank that it, it it's a mandate for a minimum. Like for instance, if I put a hundred dollars in the bank they can go and loan out $90 of it. Right. And so they just created $90. Right. Out of thin air. Yeah. But they... It seems to me that some wouldn't do that. But it's it's mandated that that's the rate, right? Or or it's a it's it op optional? Well, I think it's because it's allowed then oh yeah like if you're a bank and you're not doing that you're not going to be able to compete right okay because the you're the money supply is just going to run away from you i see okay yeah i don't think a bank could operate in the united states today with 100 percent reserves of of dollars maybe if it was a gold bank it probably could do that okay What is meant by qualitative credit control? Qualitative credit control? I don't know. Hopefully, Robert Murphy will tell us. It doesn't, doesn't mention that. In, it's a small summary. Qualitative credit control. That's in section four? Section five. Boy, I should be using the um, internet for this so I can search through the text and pull out that term rather than using my eyes. Yeah. Um, but I'm pretty close. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> is there a, a subtitle to this section? Credit expansion, section 5. I'm going to say it doesn't jump out at me immediately, so I think I'll have to move on and say I don't know the answer to that question. Qualitative credit expansion? Credit, qualitative credit control. I think I was saying Qualitative cre credit control.
Well, I don't know. What else is next? Um, what would be the consequences if credit expansion were limited to special interest groups? Um, the people that touch the new money first are the ones that will benefit the most. Oh, yeah. Credit expansion, like, oh, here's a bunch of farmers that are going to get credit expansion and... Um, you know, the steel industry or, or the auto manufacturers, like, they're going to be the ones to benefit. And then as credit expansion increases the money substitutes in the economy, people suffer from the effects of it, the inflation. But the original people who touched it don't. Yeah. Is it possible to pursue a credit expansion without affecting stock prices? I don't see how. Yeah. It seems like it's a pretty direct correlation. Yeah. And we're seeing that today. Right. Why is the only real problem to produce more and to consume less in order to increase the stock capital stock of capital goods available? Right, and that's the only, like, you can inflate the money supply and stock prices can go up, but if that's just, if we're consuming more than we're producing, we're not building up real capital. It's the only way to have things, to have more stuff, is to make more stuff. Yeah. Why do public works projects actually intensify the crisis? Well, I would I would think because it has p productive people employed in unproductive m ventures, they they may appear to be productive, like oh well these people built a dam and so that's good. But essentially, if it's government commissars deciding, and not the market, then people could be digging holes, and doing really useless stuff, and we don't really know what the market demands, what what people are actually willing to pay for, just what people you know, with fancy government chairs want. Hmm. And they're spending other people's money, which is the, the least efficient way to spend any money. Right. All right. So six, foreign exchange control and bilateral exchange agreements. What is it meant by the term scarcity of foreign exchange? Why does Mises endorse this terminology? Scarcity of foreign exchange. What does that mean? Scarcity of foreign exchange? I don't know. I could guess that it's mm. I don't know. Okay, I'll just uh, read it. Please. Because of national prestige and to deny the harmful harmful effects of its inflationary policy, a government may decree a maximum price quoted in the domestic currency for units of a foreign currency, which is below the market exchange rate. As with any price, this leads to a shortage of the foreign currency because domestic citizens wish to purchase more units of it with their domestic currency as payment than foreign citizens wish to sell it. This situation is blamed on speculators and an unfavorable trade balance and is described by the nonsensical phrase, a scarcity of foreign exchange. Okay, so they... Okay, so they set a price ceiling for a foreign currency. 
So the government says that Bitcoin can only be sold for one thousand dollars, and so the situation is blamed on spec speculators um, for there being a shortage on Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Because everyone would want to buy it up at that price. Yeah, and so, and it is described by the nonsensical phrase, a scarcity of foreign exchange. Oh, so it's a nonsensical phrase? Yeah. Scarcity of foreign exchange. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good concept to know. Can governments alleviate an unfavorable trade balance by restricting the imports their citizens can make? So unfavorable trade balance means that we are importing more than we are exporting. I guess, but to, I don't know, which one's more favorable? I think the United States has it pretty good right now because we import a lot of goods right now than we export, and we're just giving them these dollars for them. So it's like they're giving us a bunch of free stuff for these dollars. Yeah, it's quite like that. So I would even question, like, what is an unfavorable trade balance? I think classically you could say our trade balance is unfavorable because we have a deficit, but it seems to me that we're getting a bunch of free stuff. I think that economists generally consider an unfavorable trade balance to be one in which a country is importing more than it's exporting Mm -hmm. because it's not making the money, it's sending money out. Yeah. So uh, the government is not going to be able to alleviate this by restricting the amount of imports the citizens can like can do because maybe temporarily but restricting the imports is going to hamper their economy. Yeah, it, and they're not going to be able to compete in the long run. People I I don't know how many ways this book can say it, but people should just be able to trade with each other. Yeah. That's what's best for everyone is when they have free trade to trade their goods and services with whomever they want in whatever quantity they want. So here's the comment to end the chapter. Mm -hmm. The only people who are too dull to grasp what is really going on and let themselves be fooled by the bureaucracy terminology are the authors of books and articles on new methods of monetary management and on new monetary experience. Thing that comes to mind is um, modern monetary theory, Mm -hmm. MMT, I think, has been brought up recently. I think think Bernie Sanders' economic advisor is the one who coined this term. Oh, really? I believe so. Oh. Or she she's a prominent teacher in MMT theory. It's amazing that he has an economic advisor. I mean, if you want to call it an economic advisor. <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. She's crazy. Recommend looking up some of her interviews. Okay, yeah, that sounds like fun. Um well, this was a hell of a chapter. Yeah. This was great. Currency and credit manipulation. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's a big one. Yeah. I feel like that's one of the chapters that we've really been building up to that you couldn't get without all the backstory. Right. And uh, I can't wait for us to do the chapter on uh, syndicalism and corporativism and also... Um, yeah, let's war. aim to do... Let's... So the next one is chapter 32, Constitution. Confiscation. Confiscation and redistribution. But it yeah. seems like it's pretty short. Yeah. So next time we meet, we should have the goal to do that and... Um, Syndicalism. Syndic- and corporatism. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great. Chapters 32 and 33. And then we've got war. 
after that. Economics of War. Mm. That'll be great. And, yeah. So we're almost finished this book. 